Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Shuchi, one of the co-founders of the Chennai Photo Biennale Foundation. And uh, it's very exciting that in spite of uh, these very, very challenging times and a good couple of years, uh, we have still been able to go through a third edition with our fantastic team of curators, one of whom is here, Boaz Levin, uh, and also joined uh, uh, by Bhuma Padmanabhan, Arko Datto, and Kirsten Mayanke, who's also here with us on screen, Bhuma's in the audience. <laughs> so uh, thank you, uh, everyone, once again. We have with us uh, one of our artists uh, who is exhibiting. Uh, her name is Lisa Rave, and um, I will quickly just uh, give us very, very quick introduction to Boaz for those of you who may or may not uh, have known him before. Uh, Boaz Levin is an artist, writer, and curator who lives and works in Berlin. Levin is the co-founder together with Vera Tolman and Hito Steirel on of the Research Center for Proxy Politics. In 2017, he was the co-curator of the Biennale für Actual Photography, which is staged at the exhibition venues in Heidelberg, Mannheim, and Lud Ludwig Schaffen. Uh, he is the author of On Distance, uh, uh, and uh, Levin is the editor of Cabinet's Magazine's kiosk platform. So check out more uh, about the Biennale. We've shared the link in the chat. Uh, the Biennale is currently on till 6th of February, both digitally as well as in some physical venues in Chennai. And uh, I will now hand over to Boaz to have this conversation with Lisa uh, and take this evening forward. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Suchi, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm just going, I have to open the door for a second for my cat so he doesn't meow the whole time we're going to sure. uh, talk, so just bear with me for one second. Absolutely. Good to have cats in the audience as well. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah. <laughs> so good evening, everyone, um, or good morning, uh, wherever you are, wherever you may be. Um, I'm really happy that we can have this talk with uh, Lisa today. Um, I'll just say a couple of very short introductions, um, or you know, give you some information about uh, Lisa's background. Uh, Lisa Rave is an artist, filmmaker. Uh, she studied uh, experimental film at the University of the Arts in Berlin and photography at Bard College in uh, New York. She was a fellow at the, the Current, which was a program at uh, TBA 21, Tyson Bonemitsa uh, Art Contemporary Academy, uh, also at the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne and at uh, the Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart in 2014. And her work has been shown uh, internationally among others at the Kunstmuseum Basel, the Berlinische Gallery in Berlin, in a kind of uh, showcase monographic uh, exhibition, which I was lucky to see at the Museum of Modern, Modern Art Dubrovnik, Momuk, Vienna, NTU uh, Singapore, Transmediale in Berlin, and many others. Um, Lisa is also currently uh, working at the Academy of Fine Arts in Nuremberg, um, where she's teaching. Um, as part of the Biennale and the weekly screening program we've uh, set up, which is shown both online and at the Goethe Institute on location uh, two days a week. Um, as Suchi mentioned, you can access this via the website um, and get a viewing link if you haven't already watched the film. As part of that program, we're showing Lisa's video European, which was produced in 2014, um, which I won't say too much, but just in two lines, uh, draws connections between um, the colonization or the Papua New Guinea's colonial past and the planned uh, excavation of rare earth um, elements, at, um, specifically the rare earth element European at the seabed of the Bismarck Sea. Um, and it's, it's really quite a remarkable video it's 20 minutes uh, long a 20 minutes long video essay um where she kind of uh, where the 
the narrative is weaved around this one um, element, European, uh, whose fluorescent uh, qualities are actually used um, to validate the bills of the euro uh, currency. But they are also used uh, to ensure the colors of uh, flat screens uh, services and, and various other screens we use, such as the screen you might be using to view this talk of ours. Um, so I was thinking, I mean, first, I'd, I'd love to just hear from you, Lisa, um, how you started uh, working on this film, how you came about to, to produce this film. Um, can you tell us a bit about the background um, that, that's, yeah, brought you to make this? Yes, for sure. Um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to the to the show and to the talk. And thanks, everyone, for joining um, from wherever you are. Um, so, yeah, it started in, I don't know, um, 2012 or 13, I guess. I, um, I learned about the deep sea mining um, uh, that was planned in, in uh, the Bismarck Sea. So, so I don't know, I, I read about it in an article and then I got really curious about um, the Bismarck Sea itself, where it, it locates and, and, and the history of the place itself and got really deeper into to researching about the history, the German colonialism in that area also, specifically because um, my great grand uncle, August Rave, he was um, captain during the German um, colonial times in the South Pacific. So I remember specifically playing as a child with seashells that he had brought back. And so they were lying in our house. And so there was a connection between that area through through uh, shells very early on. And um, yeah, through coincidence, I, um, yeah, when I researched for the work, this was always in the back of my mind and I got deeper, deeper into thinking um, about creating this work. And so it was almost like, um, yeah, like a, a spiral, you know, like really um, drilling into thought yeah. process. So, the, the, yeah, exactly. So the, the shape of the shell that I'm showing in the work as well. And, and so the film itself is kind of a bit structured like a shell itself. So it starts with like, um, you know, historical footage of the area and then, and certain things are repeated. And so it sort of spirals out, out you know, continuously. And things are repeating in the same structure, but sort of um, in, in in other forms. So I don't know if that makes sense if you haven't seen the film, but um, this was kind of the way I I thought about it. And then, of course, originally my plan was to actually travel to the South Pacific to Papua New Guinea and film on location. And um, but I didn't have the means back then to go and also it felt kind of crazy to, to travel there by myself, you know, and um, or with somebody else, but still. Uh, and this sort of limitation of not being able to go sort of also, I think, um, complemented the, the conceptual framework of the film because I sort of uh, focus more on the European gaze onto the landscape from within Germany. Mm -hmm. So I found, you know, I was going through um, archival material in, in ethnological museums. I was going to scientific laboratories and institutions that were researching the area for the minerals and um, also, you know, working on uh, tracing the rare earth through shells, which I'm also showing in the film. We can talk about this later, but so I was sort of, you know, from within Germany, I sort of looked 
onto the landscape and sort of using material that I could find from within. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really, you're already touching on something which I thought was really key in this work and also later we can talk about it in other works of yours. I mean, this kind of, this, uh, and it's beautiful to think about, to think about the fact that this came out of, this grew out of our strength, out of the, you know, the lack of, um, the possibility for you to travel to the location led you to focus uh, rather than focusing on the location itself, let's say, or kind of producing a certain um, representation of this location uh, and its history, you focused instead on its representation and the history of the way this place has been framed and understood and discussed and also used in a way, uh, both as a resource, but also as a resource uh, for understanding um, something about, let's say, um, this distant culture, but also through this projection also about ourselves maybe. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself because I think for, for people who haven't watched the film, maybe we should kind of unpack what, what you know, what are the different components and, and how you reach uh, or how you weave together all these disparate um, uh, narratives. Um, in the film, you begin, as you said, it kind of unfolds like a shell and the, and the shell, uh, the structure of a shell, which I, I guess all of you in the audience uh, know these type of images of the golden ratio where you have a shell which is you know a, a perfect spiral so that is a motif that repeats in the film uh, and as lisa said it becomes almost i mean this repetition is really uh, inscribed into the film's narrative um, but you begin from the story of uh, the notions the origins of the notion of animism um, in the film it starts from this just this uh, quote or this not a quote but a short description um, about uh, the notion of animism, a concept which was coined by ethnographers uh, to describe a worldview in which objects possess a certain spiritual essence, uh, which European uh, colonizers and, and uh, anthropologists that came with them, who were often theologians in the 19th century, so they attributed this type of uh, worldview to the indigenous populations, communities they encountered in the South Sea. Um, and, and this, in a way, I guess, you don't say this explicitly, you just leave this description uh, in the air in the film. But I thought that was a very interesting, um, you know, introduction <laughs> to, to the film, because from, from there you move on um, to a description of the taboo. Um, which maybe you can say something about that, because that's, I think, a central um, moment where the story of the shell kind of comes to the fore or is introduced. Uh, and this, in the sense, the physical shell, uh, the, the shell which is you've probably encountered uh, at your or from your grandfather's uh, documents or from, from things he collected. Uh, but has a very interesting his history in, in kind of its place in anthropology. Yes, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so when when I was researching on the on the film and its structure, I came across um, something that existed before um, German occupation in the area or European invasion, so to speak, um, colonialism. Um, was that there was a different form of, of currency existing, which was um, based on, on shells. And um, so people were, uh, they didn't have um, currency as we know it. It was, um, it was um, you know, exchange was based on trade, trade of, of uh, produce and, um, and then there was a very different form of currency, um, which was used in more in ceremonies, which was which was um, shell money, and it was called taboo, and um, and something that was yeah very um, um, 
uh, sacred to the to the to the community and and um, when there were uh, Ger Germans coming and they wanted to uh, do trade with the, with the local community, they didn't have, um, they didn't own taboo, obviously. So they tried to um, also uh, fake it, produce it art artificially, which is a really uh, awkward uh, thing to do because the value of, of the shell money is, is created through giving it from um, generation to generation and actually, um, yeah, um, it, the value is created through um, touch and marks and on its surface. Well. Huh? Yeah. And kinship relations. I mean, it's not yes. really, it's not like this type of, uh, it, it's not a form of currency in the sense of a market, uh, but it's uh, something which, def, you know, defines kinship relations and, and defines hierarchies with, within a, um, within a, a social structure. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So you yeah, actually, yeah. Um, uh, it's not, it's not about um, it. You sort of, um, the value this is defined by being able to give rather than to, um, you know, to uh, possess uh, directly or to, to, sort of um, uh, collect uh, or, or have huge amounts stuck away, you know? So it's like a very different different understanding of, of um, um, yeah, possession, if you will. Um, so, yeah, so that was very, uh, a very interesting, um, Thing I came across and and through a time obviously now uh, shell money doesn't really exist anymore um, as it used to be because you know the uh, the economic structure of of Europe was sort of um, you know um, transferred towards those communities to to um, trade and also. Um, yeah, also the, the sort of um, belief structure, the Western belief structure was sort of, you know, brought, brought over to the communities and, um, yeah, and their belief them. structure in terms of like animism and believing in, in you know, the sort of um, life within every entity was sort of seen as something very primitive yeah and this was i guess part of what was useful i mean in quote unquote for european uh, colonizers in this concept of uh, taboo as it was used in the 19th century it was also a structuring a hierarchical uh, kind of um yeah concept which set apart or which allowed them to distinguish between um between what they saw as kind of advanced um, uh, religions and savagery, which of course later, I mean, a lot of anthropologists also, um, people like Mary Douglas noted how, you know, ironic this was because it was coming from a Victorian society, which was full, filled with these type of uh, distinctions and prohibitions, uh, which they projected onto you know, the communities that they colonized um, in order and, and created a certain, a certain kind of understanding of superior understanding of, uh, you know, uh, civilizational, um, yeah, civilizational hierarchy kind of based on this projection. Um, yeah, absolutely. But I, like, I, really, I found really interesting in the film was that this then also sets the tone or introduces um, the fact that uh, these shells, I guess, maybe you can say something about the, the fact that they collect the elements from their, um, from their environment, uh, so that they're used now, you show the scene where they are analyzed uh, in order to trace the type of elements that are uh, prevalent in the seabed. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
yeah, that was very curious for me to to find out about that. Actually, I mean, it's really hard to trace the the rare earths on the bottom of the ocean. So what the scientists do is that they use the sh shells, seashells, uh, from from the ocean bed uh, to to look at um, basically what they are made out of. So they sort of analyze their 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 makeup, if you will, through a chemical process. Um, to trace the rare earths that are existing in the area. So actually the shells themselves have europium within them, which is very curious. There's this direct link then obviously to um, the European currency, which has uh, europium uh, embedded in, inside of it. It's the, the phosphorant uh, feature that you see only uh, under certain conditions and, you know, and, and, and under black light, I think it's called in English, um, neon light, um, where you see uh, where it's being verified as real currency, you know, so um, there's this uh, really interesting connection between, um, yeah, shell and shell currency and our um, European banknote. Yeah, and again, the fake and the real and how, you know, the projection is kind of the fact that I, I love this mo mo moment again, uh, like you said, uh, all these motifs that repeat or recur. And in exactly. this case, it's, you know, the faking of the shells by the European and then the use of this material, which is extracted from shells uh, to verify uh, their paper money, you know, the currency. Uh, so there's this beautiful kind of... Um, yeah, you know, almost a, a chiastic structure, almost kind of a um, composition, uh, ring composition. Um, but going back to what you talked about earlier, just the fact of uh, not being able to go there and then in focusing instead on, um, you know, the European gaze or how this place has been represented from afar and maybe the role that this representation has played. I thought it was also very interesting because that's reflected in how the film is produced and shot uh, via screens. You know, there's so much of the film is, is uh, structured and, and uh, you know, basically um, has a shot of a screen where something is being shown, where you see the frame of the screen. So the frame is part of the object. Um, mm -hmm. just as the anthropological frame is part of the object. But of course, it also kind of, uh, you know, reflects on this, uh, the presence of this material in the screens themselves. So I thought that was also a very interesting and, and um, you know, powerful way of, of thinking of kind of the interrelatedness of form and content uh, with regard to this na narrative. Um, but that a bit, um, you know, brings me to to uh, to wonder, or to if you could talk a bit about um, your filmic and kind of filmic and, and research practice more generally, um, because this is also something which I saw repeating in other projects of yours, uh, especially let's say in the the following the project you produced uh, immediately after European uh, burning in patterns. Uh, maybe uh, you can say something about, about that film, uh, which was produced in 2015 and how it's developed out of European. Um, yes, sure. Uh, I mean, what, what was interesting for me in, in European was also to make a film that essentially is a film about something invisible that you don't see but that is sort of um, an important element of actually presenting images so it's embedded in every image that we see and it's also and the way we see them and the way they you know the brilliance of the images is produced through that material that has such um, uh, geopolitical um, histories and presence and um, I 
I also obviously it's it's the material that I need for my work uh, because I'm working essentially with image production. So it's not that I'm looking at it probably from a highly critical standpoint. It's more observational and it's more sort of um, out of curiosity, but I'm not sort of taking myself out of the occasion. It's I'm sort of woven into, and the film itself is woven into the geopolitical issue that I'm talking about. And um, I guess what I was interested in or when I was working on Europium, I worked also with, as I mentioned, um, ethnographical material from the region because, uh, um, yeah, I was curious basically who recorded um, the material, who brought it to Germany and who, um, I was interested in the, in the authorship, even though these ethnographic materials supposed to be objective and show, you know, the culture as it is, but um, obviously there's somebody that went there, somebody that engaged with the communities um, and ha has a high impact on how it is represented. So I, I contacted or I researched um, the, the filmmaker of the, that material I used and found him. He was an, um, back then he was 83 years old mm -hmm. and he traveled um, to many, many countries and filmed indigenous communities all over the world, but specifically in the South Pacific region. I think he made over 400 films. And so I decided to, and he was basically in the process of making his own museum about his work. Mm. Um, I think also out of a frustration of never really having played a role as an author or as a filmmaker or his work itself uh, never was supposed to play a role because they, uh, they had to be, uh, the films are supposedly absolutely neutral and not having an authorship. Yeah. So, um, so it was a good moment because he was interested in a portrait of himself and showing his work. And I was interested in, in revealing the stories behind the material that he shot. And also specifically the stories that are not part of the material. Um, that are sort of cut out or are the negotiations of how to get to images, for example, um, in some communities in, the, in, the, in Papua New Guinea, he was only allowed filming because he was perceived as a, as a ghost um, because of his white skin. And so he was allowed filming things that were actually um, hidden or were never supposed to be seen or visible to uh, one part of the community. And then there were other, uh, the, the other part of the community, they were like um, making sounds as ghosts and, but it was never supposed to be revealed. It was always, you know, this sort of uh, mystery that he then was able to document as being a ghost himself. Uh, so, or pretending to be. So these stories I wanted to, um, yeah, yeah, bring forward in that film that I made. Uh, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, it's both a, be a beautiful, um, I think, um, you know, beautiful to see the process of how this project, uh, which is longer, I think it's, how long is it, 40, 40 minutes, the second film? The film no, that, film. oh, yeah, um, I think Belgium? it's also around 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 roughly. minutes, then European is 20. Um, exactly. So it's a slightly longer work, which grew out of your, you know, um, engaging with the material, which started out as this kind of, I mean, it's, these sort of the sort of footage that one finds online in archives and and often um, goes unacknowledged uh, and is, is is taken as a kind of you know given 
And here, just like when you examine the materiality and uh, histories and the networks um, behind uh, the, the resources, the material resources that go into producing, let's say, the screen, you went and traced uh, the history of this footage. But I, what I mm -hmm. found also interesting is, again, going back to this, your decision to kind of uh, frame the frame or, you know, stay in, in Germany and film uh, something which is about how this place is represented. Um, there's also something which is very, you know, very, um, I don't know, rigorous in how you also step back and take this type of ethnographic gaze which you place or project towards um, the ethnographer in this case, you know, you are also then placing yourself in the position of this kind of observer, um, just, I mean, in, in a way that's very different from, from him or from other observers, you always constantly acknowledge this fact. But I thought that was, um, yeah, that's, uh, I think a very, interesting sense which is sorry good for the cats <laughs> um, that's also we have like this meta narrative here with the cat behind me um, <laughs> but uh, yeah i thought that's also something which which is interesting and and common to um, throughout your work this type of um gay author al almost like an author is ethnographic gaze um but at the same time, one, one which is very uh, conscious or aware of, of its fallibility, of, you know, its subjectivity, of your own uh, biases, um, which makes this work very, um, yeah, I think very interesting and very strong for people who, who are interested in maybe uh, both the history of this type of gaze, uh, but also questions of kind of materiality um, and, and uh, I guess, yeah, the way images are framed, understood, and, and travel. Um, I was thinking that there's another uh, film I'm kind of interesting on touching on before we open this up uh, to questions from the audience, um, but just maybe briefly you can say something about it because, um, because it's almost like these three films are a trilogy, although they, as, as we spoke uh, earlier, they're very different, but they also have this common logic. Uh, and this is a film that you produced in uh, 2017, so two years later, uh, called Americum. Um, oh, which so, yeah. One... Yeah, um, how? Ameriti Ameriti yeah, Ameriti 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 yeah, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's again, you can hear it's already, it's an element. So maybe you can say yeah, something it's an about an element. Uh, yeah, just before coming to that. Yeah, what you said is right. It's like um, this sort of, uh, it's, I think I'm also very interested in uh, Jean Rouge and his work, which was kind of a reversed um, ethnography, you know, looking at your own culture rather than, and looking, through your, on your own culture, how your own culture looks at other cultures or engages with other um, cultures. And I thought that was something that I was very interested um, in. And I, I think that's something that comes through these three films actually. And Amritium, yeah, you're right. It's another element from the periodic table, but a very different uh, one, which is um, is invisible. It's a radioactive element. Um, so that was really a challenge to make a film about because it's actually, <laughs> whereas europium, you know, is an element to to present images. This is an element that actually you can't really you can only film the effects of it or the mm -hmm. traces. Yeah. So and it's a man man made element, no? Which is also different. exactly. It's absolutely man-made, and it, uh, yeah, it's a byproduct of of uh, atomic or you know um, uh, a waste, radioactive waste. So it stays uh, with us for ten thousand years. Is that material that we have to uh, bury and um, don't really have, you know, um, 
yeah, a solution yet um, to where to, to really store it for, for that length of time. And yeah, just to mention that right now it's, it's again uh, in discussion, you know, of, uh, of um, having, um, you know, right, um, you know, um, Atomkraft, what is it in yeah. English? Uh, as, as atomic, uh, um, uh, how do you call them? Um, I mean, nuclear reactors. So atomic energy, yeah. energy, which is based on nuclear energy. Yeah. Yeah, as, 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 as sort a sort of, of, of uh, uh, let's say, less uh, sustainable, carbon. exactly. Yeah, yeah, more sustainable, less wasteful energy source. Uh, it's so, but this issue, yeah, exactly. But th this issue of of waste, this, of yeah, waste is a huge, mm -hmm. it's 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 a huge problem. So, um, I was making the film with um, another filmmaker, Eric Linderman, who's uh, American um, from the U.S. Um, yes, American filmmaker and artist, and we filmed in the Nevada. Uh, desert and there is um, a mountain, the Yucca Mountain plant was planned as um, a storage facility for, uh, for radioactive waste and it's, it's within an area which is the mostly bombed area in the world uh, where the, in the 60s a lot of um, nuclear tests, bomb tests were um, were made and um, so they decided to make this mountain as a perfect site for storing nuclear waste so it's already has uh, it's already hollowed out there's a 10 kilometer long tunnel within the mountain but as of yet they have not been um, going forward with storing the material inside and the area itself and the mountain, specifically the Yucca Mountain, is a sacred mountain to the Shoshone, which is an um, uh, uh, um, uh, indigenous population still living in the area. And um, um, there are a lot of demonstrations to sort of, you know, stop the efforts of putting nuclear waste into that specific uh, natural entity, which uh, is yeah so we the film sort of takes the journey through that mountain and it's sort of a if you will a um, backward journalism so we sort of start with the idea of uh, making a film about americium and then um as it is something that you can't really See. film Mm -hmm. See film, uh, we engage with a lot of communities uh, that live around the mountain and, and um, sort of um, try to, yeah, try to, try to narrate the film uh, through, you know, engaging with the community, but also traveling through the hollowed out mountain itself, talking to uh, scientists, um, um, also spending uh, time in a, in a, um, with the Shoshone and um, also in Las Vegas, which is really close to, to the Yucca Mountain site. And actually it talks about, um, um, you know, more also an, an, an American ideology embedded within or U.S. American ideology embedded in that in that landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, to those, I mean, maybe it's not clear from how we pronounce the the name of the film, but this americium, like Europium, so it's an element that's named after the continent, of course, America, in this case. Um, so again, there's this kind of embedded history, you know, um, or this intertwining of. Uh, material history and ideology um, in a similar exactly. way uh, to, to the story of European, mm -hmm, but in a mm -hmm. totally different, I mean, totally different landscape, totally different stakes. And in this case, as you say, other than something which is phosphorescent, which is 
uh, em em emanates images, you have something which is totally uh, hidden and, and, in that, and your technique or your filmic, um, the form you choose is also very distinct um, because, yeah, because of this uh, challenge, because of this restraint. So just like the restraint of not being able to travel to Papua New Guinea, uh, send you in one sure. direction here, uh, you choose a, a different set of tools. Um, so I, I highly recommend to the audience to, uh, first of all, I mean, to watch your PM, which is accessible on our website uh, two days a week, <laughs> if you haven't mm -hmm. already. But also, um, hopefully, there'll be an occasion to watch these two other films, which are uh, really remarkable. Um, and if not, you can maybe reach out uh, to Lisa. I want to oh, open definitely. up. Yeah, I want to open up the floor, uh, maybe yeah. to audience, uh, in case there are any questions. You're very, very welcome to. Thanks. Vitamin chat. Was, and thanks, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to quickly check. Uh, Lisa, by any chance, would you have the film on your system? I thought maybe we could give a little bit of a glimpse to our audience in case if you have it on your system. It is with us on our office system, but we're working from home at, as of today. So I don't have access to it. Uh, but in case if you do and you could share your oh. screen. I mean, I have the Vimeo. Mm -hmm. yeah so maybe could we just maybe give a little bit of a glimpse just you know to yeah yeah and and then in case if anybody has any questions please put them in on the q a box lisa are you, are you what do you think should i show it five minutes of the film and then we... would it be okay yeah, yeah of course yeah. Okay. okay then i'll just uh, yeah. share Share my screen in that case. Sure. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt earlier. <laughs> so I thought maybe we could do it now before we break out for questions. Does so everyone see this? Is my uh, screen share? Yes, yes, yes. Let's see if this works. I don't know. I mean, The word animism is taken from its Latin root anima, meaning soul or life. Coined by ethnologists in the 19th century at the peak of colonialism, animism describes a worldview in which objects, animate or inanimate objects, dead or living matter, all possess a spiritual essence and are treated accordingly. Europeans applied the term to the foreign religions they had encountered amongst the native communities of the South Sea. The indigenous people did not distinguish between the spiritual and the material worlds. Animals, plants, rocks, rivers, mountains, thunder, wind, and shadow existed as endowed spiritual things. Man-made objects, fetish objects, would be prayed to and wielded a supernatural power. The Aboriginal's ignorance of science and rational thinking was considered primitive to the European explorer. 
The French rationalist Auguste Comte considered fetishism to be the most underdeveloped form of belief. This perspective led to missionary movements of re-education, integration, and bestowing upon the travelers half a world away, the intellectual right of possession. The sea was named Bismarck, and the land was called Deutsch Neuguinea. James Cook, the early explorer of the South Seas, brought the word taboo into the English language. A word in which he understood to mean that which is forbidden, consecrated, and beyond the tangible world of man. To the Tulai, the community living along the coast, taboo was also the name for their form of currency, in which shell accumulation was a symbol of individual power. Produce and products were exchanged between the communities, whereas the taboo currency was used solely as gift giving. The process of exchange in which the receiver of the taboo became indebted to the giver and was therefore compelled by custom to offer a gift in return of equal or greater value to reverse the order of debt. Salt water clamshells harvested from the sea, collected along coastlines, perhaps systematically and methodically along the strands of atom. Its value is determined by its length. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. Uh, but I think that gave you a glimpse, it gave the audience a glimpse. Uh, is my screen share still on? No. No, it's... Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so that gave you a glimpse of the video and also shows, I mean, exactly what we were talking about, both the screen of the film, which of the, uh, I mean, the frame of the screen, which is framing the film, uh, this entire sequence, which you can see. I mean, and even before the screen, there's this beautiful moment where we start from the flipping of the pages of a magazine. Uh, so an image which seems uh, in the beginning, like a still image, then is revealed as a brochure of uh, advertising screens. And then we watch um, this anthropological, uh, this type of uh, footage, which uh, might have been produced by the same um, by the same person. I'm not sure who, who you later filmed for your next film. Sorry, um, I didn't understand. I was saying what did you say? Uh, that the footage we see in the screen might have been produced. I don't know if it was produced by the same anthropologist. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The black, the black and white material was yeah, produced the um, by the filmmaker. Then I, that I later made the film about. Yeah. Um, just also to mention, maybe the the beginning and the end. The end of the film actually um, it ends in a in a shopping mall where you see. A lot of screens uh, in in an electric store, um, which show. I mean, in the magazines in the beginning as well as the end, you see these amazing, beautiful landscapes that are sort of, mm. you know, exotic and perfect looking, and they kind of um, are sort of the. You could think of it as being these sort of areas where their mining actually is supposed to happen. So there is this moment of, of what I was also thinking about is the sort of sacrifice of the actual landscape for the image. Mm -hmm. uh, and then elements of this landscape become part of the technology that animates these images of the landscape itself. 
-hmm. So that's um, also, yeah, something that was really um, something that I observed that I found very interesting as um, as sort of framing the film. Framing the film, yeah, in book ending kind of the film. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was also a very strong sequence in the end where there's a kind of orchestration uh, of this display of uh, monitors where the same, they all show the same image. Um, and then all of the images are this type of, you know, slightly kitschy, exoticized mm -hmm. landscape. Uh, but there's something almost uh, animistic about how it's kind of pulsating in the screens. Exactly, um, and, and, and sort of um, supernatural landscapes, yeah. if you know, they're highly, yeah. um, in their brilliance and color, like highly artificial as mm -hmm. well. Um, I wonder if there are any questions from the audience now that we've um, seen the uh, We sequence. don't have any in the Q&A. No, no, Do you have yeah, any? I don't see any in, in, yeah, in I don't the chat. Yeah, I don't see any as well. Uh, do you have any further questions or anyone in the audience? Now is the time. Otherwise, I'll ask one last question. I see there's something. Let's see, Q&A. Yeah. yeah. OK, um, Vijay uh, asks, hi, mm, hi. yeah. Um, as a filmmaker whose work has been seen on 75 nations worldwide, as well as festivals, museums, my concern is largely adhere to the story itself by letting the farm take the backseat. In your case, you are focusing on a farm. Why do you take uh, on stories that necessarily demand a lot of literacy from the audience? Literacy? Uh, cinematic, liter literacy from the audience, both cinematic as well as issue of film subject. Uh, this one under discussion, nuclear waste. So the question I guess is, why do you take on, um, yeah, I'm not, yeah. You want, you want literacy. To yeah, literacy. I mean, yeah. I mean, um, from my perspective, I mean, for example, in Europium, mm -hmm. the film, I'm really, it's very explanatory. It's like you don't really need to know anything before about, you know, um, the history of Papua New Guinea or German colonialism in that area, or Europium, or, you know, it's all like being unfolded over time. I mean, there are a lot of, I guess, layers and um, cross references, but the film itself, the narrative itself is very straightforward. Yeah. Um, I feel, I mean, um, it's not that you need to know a lot beforehand, in my opinion, or, I don't know how you see it was, but I think also, I think I try to make films that are not, um, that are approachable to, to people without a lot of pre-knowledge. That I think is very important to me also, to make them, mm -hmm. make work accessible. And also I've been showing it not only in art context, which I also found interesting. They also found like European, for example, was, um, it was shown in Bremen first in an exhibition, mm -hmm. and then uh, um, uh, I think she was a um, naturalist, uh, uh, um, biologist actually, and she invited me to an ocean conference, uh, which was also taking part in Bremen, because Bremen is a center of oceanography, and so it was shown in a scientific context there which was really interesting to me um, to, yeah, to just, just also discuss it outside an art uh, context, which I really liked. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or if I understood it right, but um, that's maybe my yeah. response, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good response. But I would say also, I mean, I think it's not only is it very straightforward what's you what I find very compelling about this work and, and all of the work of yours that I've that I've seen is that it has this um, 
uh, you know, I mean, this is something that I hoped uh, to see in, in all works, <laughs> all work, work, works of art uh, that I engage with is that it has these two layers that on the one hand, it's very straightforward and very um, open um, and, and kind of what you see is what you get. But on the other hand, uh, it has a very complex formal structure and you can uh, dig so much deeper if you want as, a, you know, mm -hmm. as a, as a viewer. Um, so there's all these layers that can unfold, but don't, you don't necessarily have to um, engage with them in order to understand. Uh, so I think that's, yeah, that's, it's quite open. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think it, I see it's, we've, it's already been an hour, so we might. Yeah. Uh, Ah, one. yeah. Did you want to ask your last question, Boaz, yeah. by any chance? I don't see. Uh, mm -hmm. Did yeah, you want to question? ask your last question? You said you had one last question. Oh, yeah, I had one last question. Yeah, yeah. 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 well, yeah. Yeah, I have a question I was just curious about. <laughs> so, you know, watching these uh, films again, I was really curious about um, the way you use sound and, and music, and especially, I mean, in your PM, of course, later, that's also very distinct for those who who are, were uh, able to see a meritium. But um, in European, yeah, I was curious about the sound, which is repeated. Um, if you can, I mean, the music that's repeated, if you can say something about that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, usually I really like um, the dialectic between sound and image and how this somehow, um, yeah, it creates a rupture. You know, there's like, it's like two layers that um, have their own narration and they sort of go against each other or they also create um, uh, a dialogue uh, within themselves, uh, which I like a lot. I like a lot to, I think uh, sound is as much as important as, as the image. So it, it, I give it a lot of attention. Um, and in European, I used, uh, obviously, um, I worked with a sound artist, uh, Hannah Lippert, who's, who's a fantastic artist as well. And we, we worked on the, on the voiceover, which obviously is very straightforward, but then there's sound from, um, an experimental, um, composer, uh, Oscar Zala who again made um, films um, for Alfred Erhard, who shot a lot of uh, yeah, natural, mm. very okay. beautiful and natural uh, films also on shells. He made mm -hmm. one film, it's called The Dance of Shells, which I highly recommend, it's a beautiful film. And he did the soundtrack for that. So oh, I okay. kind of, um, the one spiral shell that I have in my film, the Nautilus, actually, which is uh, the base for the golden ratio as well. You know the the typical, um, yeah, the spiral Nautilus the shell. Should be, yeah, yeah. The spiral shell. The spiral shell um, is also that image or the way it's shot is also taken. There's a reference directly to. The Alfred Erhard film, The Dance of Shells, and the soundtrack of Oscar Zala. Oh, okay. That is also so on YouTube. Because, you can yeah. You, you can watch. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I was curious. I only saw the title, The Sound of Shells, in the credits, but I didn't know what this yeah, yeah, yeah. is. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's very interesting. Alfred Erhard is also an interesting figure, uh, who's I think a lot of his collection is actually in Hamburg, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that yeah, a museum of his work also in Berlin. Not yeah, sure. there's a, yeah, there is a, a, a kind of non-profit gallery or mm -hmm. something dedicated to his mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. Um, uh, I we think have one more question. One Would more that question? be okay? Would that mm -hmm. be sure. okay? Uh, is European going to become a collaborative practice of future technology in the field of photography and graphic design. You mean the, the material itself? Um, good question. 
Or the are you referencing the film or the material I think itself? He's referencing the film. Is it becoming a collaborative yeah, practice of future technology in the field of photography and graphic design? Mm. Maybe, yeah, maybe you can explain better. I don't know what this. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure either. Um, a collaborative with regards, practice. Yeah, with regards to the I film, mean, she says. Um, um, ongoing, I mean, it's sort of, that film sort of is. Yeah, is what it is. I guess. It's, it's what it is, it's, it's sort of done and um it's yeah it's shown in various contexts but i don't know i mean there's not um, um i don't know how to <laughs> answer that question really mm. yeah it was also uh, i mean it's it's a film that he produced in 2000 uh, yeah 14, uh, 14 it was yeah. it was shown exactly so it's shown it's it's, it's been a while ago um yeah. And um, at the moment, maybe you can say something. You're involved in a project in Nuremberg, which actually has to do with art and technology or art and uh, AI. Yeah, I'm, I'm running a program there for the uh, Arts Academy, which is a collaboration between um, the uh, Technological University in Nuremberg and uh, um, um, music academy and so we're trying to have collaborative practices between disciplines yeah. engaging especially critically with um, current technology and developments um, sustainability issues um, but also approaching them um, in a very experimental artistic uh, form so we do yeah we also do talks and screenings and also um, projects that are across the universities and disciplines. Yeah, so in that sense, it almost uh, could maybe answer the question. In the ah, yeah. Of, <laughs> yeah. A sort of a <laughs> collaboration between technology and design and art. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. I think no, I think it's interesting. Thing. I think it's interesting to, yeah, not not just yeah, go go across you know the artistic discipline and sort of engage with different practices, approaches, and um, also find collaborative um, approaches working together. Yeah, I like that a lot. Great. I think that's a good. Uh... Point yeah. to now uh, close our conversation. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. Boaz. Thank uh, you. And I you encourage everyone to um, I encourage everyone to please register and sign up for uh, this film and a lot of other video artworks that are there online. They are being screened every Wednesday and Saturday, so you can get a Zoom link and want to watch it at home. Or if you're in Chennai, you can come to the Goethe Institute and watch the films in person. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Thanks, Justin. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.